morning, Acts chapter 16, just a few verses, five verses, verses 6 through 10, and the focus is on the guidance of the Holy Spirit. This is what Luke writes, they passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And after they came to Mysia, they were trying to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. And passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our understanding this morning. I want to just mention at the outset, I'm going to do a little bit of review. I'm going to deal with this text, and I'm going to make most of the application uh, towards the end. Well, two weeks ago, we saw how the Lord used the rift that developed between Paul and Barnabas to strengthen his missionary efforts. Instead of one team, now there were two. Barnabas and Mark sailed west to Cyprus, okay? And Paul and Silas traveled north through Syria and Cilicia. Now, I just want to pause here for a moment again, remind us that everything that happens, everything that happens in this world, everything we read in the Bible, everything that's happening today, everything that's happening in our lives in particular, Everything is a part of God's plan. Now, we realize when it comes to cases like this where there's conflict, where we say this is not what God desires, that it is a part of His plan, but God didn't force, you know, Paul and Barnabas to disagree. He did not divide them. But knowing that as things would work out according to their desires and, again, how everything is interconnected, that they would do this, He had planned to overrule what they were doing for good. God does that with everything, okay? He uses everything we do, even our sins, though the responsibility for our sins is always ours, and whatever happens to us for our good and for the good of His kingdom. Now, what we do is not always good, but He works it together for our good. We learn through those things. We grow into the image of Christ. Now, we also saw last week how the Lord brought another member onto Paul and Silas's team. When they came to Lystra, they found that Timothy, who had been converted on that first journey, had matured to the point where he was useful. And again, remember what it was they must have seen in Timothy uh, that indicated to them that he was ready to go on to the mission field. In a word, they saw Christ being formed in him. They saw his love for God. They saw his love for his worship and His people, and His kingdom. They saw His willingness to leave and everything behind and follow the Lord. His purpose to serve Christ no matter what the cost may be. And again, they saw His desire to glorify God. That, that's the whole purpose of God's redemption in our lives, is to bring us to a point where we give glory to Him, and that is the center of our lives. And so Paul decided to take him along. Mark didn't measure up in his estimation, but Timothy does, and the work continues to progress. Now this morning, Luke again draws our attention to the Spirit's involvement in this work. I mean, he is intricately and intimately involved in what's going on. Now up to this point, Luke has already shown us several things about how the Spirit works and what He does, how the Spirit filled, remember, the disciples at Pentecost, giving them power to be His witnesses. You know, where do we find that strength? It's only by the Spirit. How He fell on Cornelius and his household after Peter had preached the gospel to them, showing that He had received these God-fearing Gentiles into His kingdom. And notice... He received them without them first having to become Jews. That's what the Jerusalem Council was all about. How the Spirit commanded the leadership at Antioch to set aside Paul and Barnabas for the work, the missionary work to which He had called them. Again, the Spirit of God is the one who is directing this whole endeavor. He is the one who is in charge and command. 
He enabled Paul and Barnabas to preach the gospel in a powerful and convincing way so that people were converted. And of course, the Spirit breathing life where he wills. He's the one who blinded Elymas the magician when he tried to keep the Roman proconsul, Paphos, in spiritual darkness. He empowered the apostles to do miracles. And let's not forget, he also raised Paul to life after he had been stoned and left for dead. Remember what Jesus said to his disciples um, in the upper room discourse uh, on the night in which he was betrayed. He says, it is for your advantage that I go away, because if I do not go away, the helper cannot come. Well, the book of Acts is the record of how the Spirit is providing this help. Now, this morning we see it through his guidance. Now, first we see how the Spirit directed their missionary efforts. Luke tells us that Paul and Barnabas and Timothy continued to press forward into new areas, uh, as it were, breaking ground in new territory. After Timothy was on board, they headed northwest, preaching the gospel throughout the regions of Phrygia and Galatia. Now, this time, northern Galatia, uh, these uh, towns of Derby and Lystra, these are all in Galatia as well, but he hadn't yet traveled through the northern part, and that's the way he's heading as he's going basically to Troas. Now, one thing to notice here is that Paul was always interested in breaking new ground. You know, he didn't want to go where Christ had already been proclaimed. He wanted to go where he hadn't. He'll later write to the church at Rome, I aspired to preach the gospel not where Christ was already named so that I would not build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, they who had no news of him shall see and they who have not heard shall understand. Now, this, this is really the same example that Jesus gave to his disciples. I think Paul was just simply following that. Remember when Jesus sent his disciples out to teach and to preach in the towns and villages of Palestine, he told them basically to keep moving. Now, they might stay for a while in a certain place if they received them, but if they didn't receive them, he says, well, then keep moving on because the harvest is plentiful the workers are few, and you're not going to make it to the end by the time the Son of Man meets up with you again. And really, by the time Jesus' earthly ministry had ended, Palestine still had not been fully reached with the gospel. And we see that reflected in his final words before his ascension, which we're going to look at in another context in just a moment. But the idea is you still need to go through Jerusalem and Judea, but then branch out to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You know, there are so many people who need to hear the gospel. I mean, the majority of the world is still largely unevangelized. They have no gospel witness. And there are so many people even around us that it really doesn't make sense to spend all of our efforts on the people or the places that have already been reached. Our goal should be to connect with those people who have never heard the gospel, who have never had the opportunity to hear the gospel, to keep pushing forward and breaking new ground. I mean, sometimes, I mean, isn't it true that we, we often get so focused on certain individuals and their salvation that that's all we can think about? And so we spend all of our efforts there. Jesus told his disciples when they went out, if they don't receive you, shake the dust off your feet and go somewhere else where they will listen, okay? So we need to be thinking about that, need to keep moving forward, and that's what Paul and his team were doing. Now, Luke tells us they next went into Mysia, which is on the northwest of Asia. In other words, uh, as they move from, uh, and again, this is kind of reversed for me, but let's say Galatia and Phrygia are down here on the coast. They're heading northwest. They have to cross Asia to get to Mysia. Uh, and when they got to Mysia, they preached the gospel there. Now, we see where they're preaching. They preached through Galatia, Phrygia. They preached in Mysia. But what's interesting to note here are the places that they didn't preach and the places that they didn't go. Because Luke tells us that even though they crossed Asia, um, which, by the way, is not what we usually think of Asia today. It, it is a part of it. We call this Asia Minor. 
and more specifically, this is Turkey. Um, this is where the seven churches would be located that John addresses in the book of Revelation. Those churches have not yet been planted, except one of them does get planted on the end of this journey, uh, even though they had to pass through that area. And as we know, they were basically preaching wherever they went, but they didn't do it here. And when they got to Mysia, they were also trying to go into Bithynia, which if Mysia is, is here on the western coast, uh, basically Bithynia is a little bit further north, and it's over the northern area of, of northern Galatia. Uh, they didn't go there either. Okay, now the question is, why didn't they go there? Well, Luke tells us the Spirit told them not to. He forbade them to speak the word in Asia. And he did not permit them to go into Bithynia. And so now the, the more important question is this, why didn't the Spirit of God allow them to evangelize these areas? Now Luke does not answer this question directly, but I think we can guess from what we read in the rest of Scripture. And it's simply that it wasn't yet the Lord's time. I mean, didn't Jesus essentially do the same thing when He sent the disciples to go out and to teach and preach throughout Palestine, but then He told them this in Matthew 10, verses 5 and 6, Do not go in the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter any city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus says, go here, but don't go there. And the question is, why not? Well, it's because this was the time of fulfillment of God's promise to the Jews. Remember what Jesus said His mission was? He was sent primarily to seek the lost sheep of Israel. And those, what He meant by that is He went out to seek His elect, His chosen from among Abraham's natural children, because remember, not all of the physical children of Abraham are actually the children of Abraham. It's those who are of faith. And those ultimately are those whom the Lord chooses. They are the lost sheep of Israel. Sometimes we read that passage and we say, well, every Israelite that's lost is a lost sheep. Well, they are in one sense, but those aren't the ones Jesus was looking for. He was looking for His lost sheep, the ones that the Father had given to Him. So those are the ones He was looking for in His ministry. Those are the ones He sent His, his disciples to reach. And after they had been reached he would send the gospel to the rest of the world. Remember what he says, just before he ascended, you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. Now, there were sheep, lost sheep, although maybe well, of the house of Israel and also lost sheep among the Gentiles in Asia Minor, Again, let's not forget about Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum and all these different, you know, uh, churches that are planted in the book of Revelation and in Bithynia. But these would be gathered later. Actually, before the second missionary journey ends, Paul will preach to the Jews in Ephesus, which is one of the churches of Asia Minor and listed in the book of Revelation. And then on his third trip, will go to the Gentiles and also preach to them there. So again, the Spirit has His timing, he has, he has His will. And it's not, if He has them pass over, it doesn't mean that's absolute. It's just not His time. Now, when they arrived at Troas, which is in Mysia, which is on the coast, coastal city, port city, where they also evangelized, the Spirit gave Paul further guidance through a vision. He saw a man from Macedonia. Macedonia is modern-day Greece, appealing to him to come over and to help them. When Paul told his companions, they understood what the Spirit was saying, and they immediately set their hearts to go over there. And again, just note a couple of things here. Notice continuing to break new ground. Notice the zeal they had to push forward. Notice the Spirit's help in giving them guidance. Now, let me just note one more thing before we move to application, and it's the change, the change of pronouns here, which I don't know if you notice, but it's, it's, it does stand out to you once you see it. In verse 8, we read, And passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. 
And this is the way that Luke has been referring to it up until this time. He's saying they did this, they did that. But now in verse 10, we read this. When he, Paul, had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now he's using first person, personal pronouns, whereas before they were third person, personal pronouns. And what, what's the difference? You know, what happened? Well, it's because here the author of Acts joins the missionary party. Luke is now converted and he has joined them. One commentator writes this, it is probable that he was a physician in Troas and was there converted by Paul to whom he attached himself. He accompanied him to Philippi, but did not share his imprisonment, nor did he accompany him further after his release in his missionary journey at this time. Now, it's interesting that after they leave Philippi, we don't see this we anymore, but we see they again. And then when he returns to Philippi again, then we see Luke rejoin them again. So Luke is in Troas. He gets saved there. He goes across to Philippi with them. I guess I should be doing it the other way around. Um, Troas to Philippi, and there he stays until they come back around. Now, what I'd like to do is end the narrative here and consider a few applications from what we've seen. Now, first, I think we can say the Spirit was clearly guiding them, very powerfully guiding them. He brought them to those places where He would save His elect people. But the question we need to ask for ourselves today is this, does He still guide the church today? Does He still guide us? Well, I'd like to suggest that the answer to that question is yes. First of all, because there's nothing in the Scriptures that would lead us to conclude otherwise. And we would also have to admit, the need certainly is still there. When Jesus said He would be with His church until the Great Commission was finished, He meant He would be with us by His Holy Spirit to empower us, but also to guide us. And I'd go even a little bit further and say this, to guide us to those whom He is intending to save. You know, the Spirit of God isn't just leading us willy-nilly through the world uh, with no purpose. He's leading us to the people who need to hear the gospel and people whom He is intending on saving. Now, the, the second question is, how does the Spirit guide us today in this endeavor? Well, well first of all, He doesn't speak to us directly uh, as He did to the believers in Antioch when He said, set apart for me Paul and Barnabas to the work to which I've called them. And how He may have also spoken to Paul by saying, don't preach in Asia and don't go into Bithynia, or how He communicated with him through this vision of the man of Macedonia saying, come over and help us. These ways of communicating ended when the Scriptures were complete. And I don't have time to argue that point, so I'll just leave that there. But that doesn't mean He still doesn't speak to us. He simply speaks in other ways. Now, one of the ways He does this is obviously through His Word. Now, when we go to the Word of God, what He says to us here is fairly broad, isn't it? Our Lord tells us in Mark 16, verse 15, with regard to our obligation as a church in missions and evangelism, that we are to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. So I guess we can say there that, okay, it, it's pretty, pretty broad, pretty open. But we need to understand that this is the same mandate that He gave to His disciples, even, even to Paul and to, to uh, Silas and Timothy as they're going out there. And yet, they still needed guidance, and He still provided guidance. So, how can we know precisely where we are to go? Well, we need to look at this from a couple of different angles. First of all, you know, um, we need to look at where the Lord is actually working, where He's opening doors, and where not. We can apply this more broadly to the work of missions. When a missionary board is trying to decide where to send missionaries, where do you think they're going to send them? to countries that are open or countries that are closed? Well, we're going to send them, of course, to the open countries. And that's one way that God guides, okay? The Lord has opened some countries, perhaps, I'm not sure if it's a majority of countries, but there are many that are open. 
But others, he has allowed to remain closed. I mean, just show up at the door of North Korea and say, you're a missionary, I'd like to come in and evangelize. What do you think is going to happen? Or now in Afghanistan, you know, there are places that really are closed to the gospel. Well, the same thing is true when it comes to our individual, you know, mandate to evangelize. Uh, the Lord opens doors and closes doors. There are some individuals who are open. There are other individuals who are not open. Now, secondly, I think we need to consider uh, what it is that Paul said about his own ministry in reaching out. And that is, am I just hashing over ground that's already been plowed and planted? Or am I breaking new ground and planting new seed? Who has been reached and who not? Well, I think when it comes to the work of missions, we need to focus more on those countries that have no gospel witness than those that, that have, you know, uh, on those individuals who have never heard the gospel more than those that have heard it many times or maybe have a corner church that they could go to any time they want and, and hear the gospel. Uh, I think the same thing, again, is true with regard to us and, and in, on an individual um, uh, you know, an individual plane. Uh, how many times has this person I'm evangelizing heard the gospel? And what about these other people I know that have never heard it? You know, which one do I need to go to first? And I think along with this, and, and this we have to be careful with, we also need to consider the more subjective side of the Spirit's leading. Yes, He opens and He closes doors, but does He do anything else? Well, He, he speaks to us in His Word. The mandate is there, but does he do anything else? Well, there is, I think, a compulsion the Spirit of God can place on us sometimes to share. Maybe you have felt that. You know, I, you, you pass by this individual or maybe you know this individual and you realize, I've never really talked to this person about Christ and suddenly it just sort of hits you. I need to talk to this person. And so you go back and you talk to them. I remember one time in a non-charismatic setting, in a, uh, you might say, well, non-charismatic, um, dispensational, evangelical church. The assistant pastor of that church said, I was walking down the street one day and I saw somebody across the street and, this, and he says, the Lord said to me, go talk to that person. Now, this person who said that did not believe that the Spirit of God speaks audibly to him, but he did believe the Spirit of God was telling him he needed to go talk to that person. And so he went and talked to that person. And I think contrary-wise, there may be a situation where you may want to talk to somebody, but you just somehow don't feel comfortable doing it. You feel somehow restrained, and maybe the Spirit of God is saying not to talk to this individual. And now we have to be careful here again, like I say, because sometimes that kind of restraint can be following our own desires rather than the Lord's unless we happen to be those people who are just so outgoing, we want to talk to everyone, and it's unusual to be restrained. If we're more often than not restrained, then we have to be careful that that restraint isn't just simply ourselves telling ourselves, don't get involved. You know, the Spirit of God can guide us in, in this way, but we just really need to be careful. And then lastly, we need to remember what Jesus said to His disciples on the Sermon on the Mount not to cast our pearls before swine. If we have shared the gospel with someone and they are, you know, uh, openly, you know, hostile towards it, then the Lord says refrain from sharing it with them again. Unless, of course, the Lord changes somehow their attitude. Now, let me just say, having said all of that, we take, you know, taking all that the Spirit shows us into consideration we should still find plenty of opportunities. I mean, even with these restrictions, do you think Paul and Barnabas had nobody to talk to? They were continually sharing the gospel with as many people as they possibly could. There was just certain areas that they weren't able to go and break ground at that time. There's always going to be plenty of opportunities, but by following the Spirit's guidance, I think our efforts could be more productive. So let's thirdly remember just two things in closing. Let's remember that the Spirit of God does provide more than guidance. He also provides faith and courage, the faith to share the gospel, 
you know, and of course the strength to uh, be able to uh, well, to break through those barriers that keep us from getting out to others. And the second thing is that it's not up to us to convert someone. Remember what R.C. Sproul talked about in apologetics. We are to give proof, we are to share the message, but we cannot necessarily persuade. Uh, there's a lot that goes into that, but let's just put it this way. We cannot convert them. That's the spirit of God's work. He must convert them. He breathes new life when and where He wills. But this is the thing we need to remember, that when He wills, when it is His will to bring new life, before He does it, He sends the gospel. He sends someone to share the gospel with them. So if He has sent us, that may very well be what the Spirit of God intends to do. And that can be very encouraging you know, to know that the Spirit of God may very well be using us to bring one of the lost sheep, one of Christ's lost sheep, to faith to Him. Not only so that that individual can be safe and doesn't have to look forward to an eternity of suffering, and that, that is important, but it's so that the Lord would be glorified in the salvation of that individual and that that individual will now begin to give glory to Him. And that's really what it's all about, is gathering the sheep together that they might give glory to God. Sometimes we reduce it down to just simply, this person is safe now, and that's great. This person has a glorious future now, and that's great. But the most important thing is that they are now turned from somebody who dishonored the Lord into somebody who now gives Him honor and glory. That's really the ultimate goal, not only that we would do that, but that they also would do that. Now, again, we're going to see that sovereign work of the Spirit of God in conversion next time when we consider uh, Lydia. But for now, let's uh, bow in a moment of prayer and let's, let's ask the Lord to help us be mindful of what we're in the world to do. You know, we have lots of other things to do as well, but while we're here, we are to be witnesses of Him, but also that we might be able to see and sense the Spirit's guidance, whether He's showing me that I need to share, share the gospel with this person or not with this person, but most of all for the courage to be able to share when He does say yes. So let, let's pray.